are at a crossroads. Our population keeps growing. The planet is in peril. Money is something that we created. And we now idolize and value so much that we're willing to destroy the planet so that we can have more of it. I feel like a hypocrite because I am pretty sure I know where this is going to go. Government fails to stop the slide. And business keeps fueling the fire. Business can't live without profits. If it doesn't make money, it dies. Every single thing that I'm looking at here is advertising. It's this pressure to deliver every quarter that keeps companies from innovating, from thinking about the long haul. But what if business is also the solution? From our standpoint, there's not a trade-off between profit on the one hand and the planet on the other. Those things are inextricably linked. Conscious capitalism, in my view, is the most profitable way to do business. We can turn things around in a radically simple way. At a certain point, you have to make choices. For us, you know, business is a tool to create change. If you can build a better business on love than you can fear, I never heard anybody talk about that. What we have the chance to do today is to democratize sustainable investing. If we can make healthy living affordable for anyone, that is a massive business opportunity. Look what you guys have done here. Stop putting your money into the hands of people that you disagree with. The consumer's voice is becoming louder and louder. He taught us all the power of thinking long term. But these people are challenging you to change and to do something different. By showing companies that they can win by investing dollars in social good and purposeful activities, they will do more of those things. Create what we all truly want. Prosperity. John, congratulations on the film. It's an incredible topic to explore. It's beautiful the way that you do it. I have to ask you, though, what does it feel like to be presenting this film in this world after having made it in this in a past world where it felt like we were all sort of getting on board with something, you know, companies and even people felt like we were getting on board with a certain amount of prog progress. And now it feels like someone has sort of taken the reins to say, no, 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 everybody who felt a certain amount of grievance over that progress, we are, we are in charge and we are your voice now. What does it feel like to be presenting the film in that world? Yeah, you know, I got to say, at first it was a little nerve wracking. You're like, uh oh, now what? And you know, I have to say, uh, not only has this helped, the hurricanes are helping. All of it are helping because people are like, what is happening, right? And and I think a lot of what brought that energy to light in the first place was people are saying, you know, Washington's messed up. I, you know, the world's getting worse. These guys aren't fixing anything. And now this happens, and it's just like, what what can I do? Me, what can I do? And so this film is filled with solutions of people who just started doing things themselves. They, they took things into their own hands and they're like, look, you know what? I'm just going to do the right thing. And then the customers are like, I like that. People, people want more of that. And so what we're trying to do is say, look, you know what? Forget about red team, blue team, any of that stuff. You know, we all want a better world. We, we all want, you know, trees to be there for our kids. So what, what does that option look like? And that's what the movie really went for. So for us, it's like we're getting all kinds of interest and energy on all sides of the political spectrum, which I, you know, at first didn't really, you know, it's like my bias is I'm an env environmentalist. But I didn't expect that. And everyone's like, yeah, no, we, we, we all want a future. Does it feel a little bit like even right now, I know you're not still doing a lot of the research, but I imagine you're still in touch with a lot of people that you talk to, that it feels like even though uh, this sort of other idea of the way that the world should work has come to power, everyone's like, whatever, we're still going to do this. Like, that doesn't matter. Like, I'm sorry, but he does not matter. We are going to continue following on this, uh, this train, this progress train. Uh, look, politicians come and go. And at the end of the day, politicians are typically bought by interests who lobby and all these types of things. And so you always have to ask, like, who, who's paying for the party? And it's the companies. So are you supporting a company who does things you don't agree with? Well, then just don't bring them your business, right? And in doing so, it starts to change the math very quickly. So just put your money in the hands of people that you agree with, that you know, match your values with your monetary value. And so, you know, what's happening in blockchain, what's happening in all these things that we're starting to notice is like the old kind of hierarchical systems don't really work anymore. And people are fed up. 
But people have been feeling powerless and not realizing that their own stake in this is like, look, every time I swipe my debit card, you know, where I keep my money at my bank, all that stuff really matters. How did the film start for you? <sighs> you know, it's, look, I didn't, I didn't know what we were getting into, really. And so we, we went with this premise of like, okay, if you vote with your dollars, what would the world look like? And so we started interviewing the people that were kind of, you know, the big names in the space, like Whole Foods founder and all these, all these things, and kind of getting the story. But then as we started following the story, we're like, wow, this is, this is way bigger than I thought, and this is way more important than I thought. Like, just we have this whole part in uh, Panama, and, you know, you could go back to the kind of origins of any immigration story by looking at like what can be done to fix the problem there. Like if you give these people a fair wage, if you take care of them and you don't make it so like this kid's got to leave his village and his sisters and his grandma and all this stuff to climb some wall to like mow my lawn. Like no, who wants that? Right? Who wants that? You know, people want to be have dignified lives where they live, and so how do we set that up? And how do we support companies and products that are doing that that stuff in a cool way, um, so that we could feel good about where our money goes and make the world a better place? Right? And so, it it opened up a lot for me. Um, and again, like I, I'm a doctor guy. I'm not like an economist guy. Like I was I was a, a Taoist monk, and I was a doctor of Oriental medicine before I got into film. And so I was just asking questions that came from naivete, which led to some real interesting results in the movie. When you talk about a, a basic living wage, you know, a lot of what's happening with companies now, especially with tech companies, is essentially sort of taking out not just the middlemen, but a lot of the people that get a basic living wage from their jobs, be it at a, at a supermarket, be it taxi cab drivers, you know. How do you feel about a basic living wage, a universal income? It's an interesting proposition, right? And so we were looking at... BI, excuse me, universal basic income. Basic, yeah. yeah. And so there are some experiments right now. Like I could say in theory, that sounds great. There's some countries that are experiment, experimenting with that. And just let's see what that does, right? Uh, you know, what we can say is like in the United States, everything's really started taking off when we hit a 2,000 calorie mark where people weren't hungry all the time and all of a sudden America became this wonderful place for, for everyone to live, right? So it's like, why, why don't we address the roots of poverty? Why don't we address the roots of what all this is? But also on the business, and I gotta say, I, I really became a fan of this. On the business side, it's like, man, there are incentives for innovation and I want like the billionaires of the future to deserve it, right? So it's like, what global problems can you tackle? Like, okay, the oceans are all getting dirty. What can, the, oh, you came up with a solution to clean the oceans? Right on. I'm happy you're rich, right? And like, and you're creating jobs and all these things. So it's, it's an interesting time. You know, we don't know where it's going, but we do know that, you know, our vote counts and you vote with the money you spend every day. You vote with, you know, where your eyeballs go. You vote with everything. Now, I have to say, on a personal level, I am generally a socialist, and I believe in the sort of the redistribution of wealth, and I have, I'm generally suspect of billionaires and, and businesses sort of doing the right thing. You know, I'm, I'm quite cynical about the, uh, the dollar that they're kind of, that they're chasing, and I'm wondering if you went into it with any kind of mindset like that and were surprised by, by, by the people that, that you met. Absolutely. So my background is I was a monk for years. I sat with the Dalai Lama. I, sat, I mean, I come from like spiritual training origins and I'm like, well, you know, why can't we all just distribute and be there? But I got to say, a lot of these guys get out of bed with this kind of DNA that allows for them to come up with creative solutions to world problems. And they're doing really cool stuff. And so, and, and, you know, I've been to these companies where like people are happy to go to work and like they're getting good, you know, they're getting paid, their families are getting fed. So, you know, I think that we're in a time where we talk about socialism, we talk about capitalism, we talk about all these things. And they're all going to kind of bleed together exactly. in some capacity. Yeah. Exactly. And so there's this. That I watched a debate between Lindsey Graham and Bernie Sanders and. <laughs> It was ridiculous. I mean, you're watching like a, a straight capitalist and a, a democratic socialist, and they're kind of on the same page about certain things, with the exception of Graham, who's like way to the right on some stuff. But it's a weird space that we're living in right now that Bernie Sanders is even like a very public figure that people, a lot of people believe in in this country. Yeah, and he's putting up very socialistic proposals, right? Uh, but, you know, I, I think we're at a time now where, uh, you know, everything has been either black or white. Right. And so I think uh, America in particular, you know, it was very puritanical when we came over here. It's like, you know, you're good or evil. It's black or white and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, gray is where the fun stuff happens. And so we're in a different era where it's like, come on, 
red team, blue team, what is that, right? And so why don't we all just have conversations? Why don't we think about what, you know, so, you know, we could agree that poverty isn't a good thing. You have, we have different uh, ideas about how to resolve these things. Well, let's just see what works and make some data-driven decisions. And so what, what I wanna see, like I'm a scientist, right? And so what I wanna see is just results. Everything else is talk. And so like, hey, if this thing worked, that's great. What else, what else can work? What could, what could make the world better? Let's not get polarized in our, our dogma, but you know, if, the, if the end result's to like, you know, just coexist better, then let's, just, let's look at what's working, right? Do you think this idea of getting polarized uh, with our dogma is something that the current president is pushing rather than pushing results or innovation? It's about sort of maintaining a polarization based on dogma? Yeah, I think unfortunately if it bleeds, it reads, and I think that he feeds off of drama and he needs that because, you know, it's reality TV. And that's where we're at. It's like we have a reality TV star that's sitting in the White House. And every time something's going on, he goes and kicks some drama up somewhere else. And it's like, look at this. And because the eyeballs are so trained to look at it, that it distracts from other things that are happening, which is, uh, it's just a mark of where we're at culturally. And, you know, I, th I think that it's really, you know, Milton Erickson, who's the founder of modern hypnotherapy, well, he was a you know, psychiatrist, really smart guy. You know, he was asked in an interview, what's it like putting people into trance all the time? He, says, he starts laughing. He's like, I, you, you don't get what I'm doing here. Like, I'm taking these poor people out of their trances, right? Everyone's walking around like zombies. It's like, look over here. Be pissed about this. And that's just, you know what? That's not using our minds. That's not using our brains. It's, it's a disservice to all the, the, you know, the, the great circuitry we have. So it's like, why don't we all just think a little more, right? Why, why don't we listen to the other side and see if there's some merit in what they're saying and try to understand each other? And, 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 and unfortunately, he's playing a bass and polarizing and you know, he's creating a lot of enemies. And I, I don't know how helpful that is. How often do you meditate these days? I'm meditating right now. Um, yeah. Um, I meditate every morning, I meditate in the evenings, but I believe that meditation is part of an operating system that one takes on that's constantly scanning to, to just be like, hey, what am I doing right now? And just check in with yourself. And I think that, you know, in, in the West, it's been kind of popularized in this thing. It's like, oh, you know, I got to go wear this meditation clothes and change my name to Sadhu and, you know, do this stuff. And I think that's all like cultural and it's all kind of, you know, needing to belong to this thing. Oh, now I'm a meditator, right? It's like, no, I, I deal with 2,200 corporations in my professional life and other things that I do. And it's just teach people how to chill out, right? And, and part of that is just understanding that's like, hey, you know, my shoulder's a little high. Let me bring it down. Taking, taking, taking a moment to take things in and to, like you said, scan it. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so like you know the the example we can use. Fixing my shoulders, right? Fixing now. your shoulders. See, see, it worked. Um, but like, it, okay, so if you're sitting there working on some document on your computer, uh, but you have your instant messenger up, you have you know like five or six other things going, and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm 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 not, we're not really getting this thing done, and you go, oh, this is this is this thing called stress. Let me go double click on meditation or yoga, and you like bring it up, you do some stuff and then you close the yoga icon and you go back to 15 open windows, you're like, yeah, that kind of helped, right? But what if your meditation was to scan and be like, hey, aren't you supposed to be working on that document? Close this, close this, close this, and close this. And when you're done with this, go stretch, do whatever, and then open the next window. But what's, what's up with having 10 windows open, right? And so I think a lot of people double click meditation just like, you know, everything's become a quaalude. It's like, it's a replacement for a drug. Like, I don't think meditation when you're having a panic attack is that great. You know, it's about keeping the fuse long so you never get to the panic attack. So it's just, I, I take issue with how some of this stuff got mistranslated in the 60s when it came over. When we talk about uh, poverty, specifically in the U.S., I know a lot of the film is not just about the U.S., it's about, you know, global issues. But when we talk about poverty, what did you find to be some of the greatest successes in terms of tackling poverty? Mm -hmm. Opportunity, living wage. Right? It's like, hey, we're gonna come to your village here and we're gonna you know, grind you down and take, extract all the value out of here and like throw you a bone and like, thanks, right? Versus companies that'll go in and, and create living wages and bring in healthcare and education and all sorts of things and help them thrive, give them you know, a, a good percentage of proceeds and Can you and give help an example a, of a company that did that? Uh, so a company that we followed um, was called Coco Well. Um, and so they had gone and they were harvesting these cocoa Coconuts, and what was happening is the the people, and it's in the film. I don't want to give away too much of the film, but so what was happening is these trade boats from Colombia would come, and they would only barter 
for the coconuts that these people were harvesting. And so they'd get the equivalent of say 40 cents per coconut, but that was in trade. So it's like, if I'm gonna sell you this cup um, and you're gonna give me coconuts for it, if I say this cup is worth 40 cents, it's worth one coconut. But now I say this cup is three dollars how many coconuts did you just give me right and so they were just they were stuck in this thing where they're just giving coconuts and getting basic and they were just stuck in poverty so this company comes in and says how about we just give you a dollar 20 per coconut and you go to the market with money and buy whatever you want <laughs> right and and so all of a sudden it's like wow that it changed everything right and so then i go in and i'm like well this there's trash on the beach like has anyone thought about the sanitation play here and so there's a lot of things to think about when you bring abundance to a culture as well but we have it's just, you are radically transforming these places by allowing them to partake in this wealth yeah. that we've only kept at the top of the pyramid in, in the West. And, you know, once it gets redistributed, like, you don't have a lot of these problems that we see. Is that something that, we, you know, we're talking about how we're impacting uh, communities globally with uh, as a company in the West, but this idea of in a, inequality and only letting the people at the top take part in the wealth is something that we're also seeing for them in a big way in this country right now as well, right? Big time. What, one of the things that I didn't really uh, know was coming in this film, because I was like, oh, you know, shop with your money and, you know, it'll, it'll make the world a better place, is, is the naivete I went in with, which, which was that that's, that's a good enough solution. And what I learned is like, man, if you're banking with one of the top five big yeah. banks, and you, let's say, I, I, I don't agree with like the prison industrial complex and like how they're turning prisons into to a business. It's like, oh yeah, well it turns out, you know, Wells Fargo invests in that. And it's like, oh, if my money's at Wells Fargo, I'm, I'm complicit. And so where your money sleeps at night, where your money is makes a big difference. And so you're like, wow, you know what? These local credit unions, not only do they take the money and give you comparable rates, they reinvest it in like his bakery down the road and like the local businesses. And they like hook, like it recirculates instead of concentrates up top. Right, and so you have all this predatory lending, you have all this you know, stuff where they're doing nasty things with our money, and there's a lot of great banks that don't do that. Right, and so that concentration of wealth, when it gets redistributed, then you don't have people fighting on the streets about like, you took my job, because there's jobs. Right, and so it, it's really like, I, I, I learned a lot about like where our 401Ks go, where our money goes in our banks. It was, it was a real eye-opener for me. Now, I realize you're not an, uh, an economist, but I'm, I'm curious why you think it is that you know, the top five banks or a company when they reach a, a point of success in a capitalist system like those banks have, like some other kinds of companies have, why they end up sort of becoming complicit or a part of the uh, sort of negative reinforcement system that we have in this country. Why can't a Bank of America also be as sort of uh, community oriented as a local credit union? Frankly, because people are watching the Kardashians because people are not watching what's happening. So when, Har when Harvard, when they found out that their endowment was being invested in coal and all this like nasty stuff, the students are like, yo, we don't want our money there. And Harvard's like, yep, sorry, we won't do that, right? But if we don't police Bank of America and Wells Fargo and all these people, I'm like, hey, hey, what are you doing with my money? They're like, yo, man, war's, war's profitable. And they'll, they'll go there. And so I think uh, what's missing is the eyeballs that are like, you know, here right now, just like going, no, you're, you're not allowed to do that or I'll just move my money. You know what happens when you move your money? They don't have money, right? And so, so they listen very quickly, but they haven't had any real disincentives to do these nasty things because people are watching whatever they're watching, right? They're not paying attention to the most important, everyone's sweating their bills, but they're leaving their money with these bad guys, right? And, and do they're it. not even good at customer service. <laughs> right. So, right, There's that too. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, you know what? I, I moved to a bank called Aspiration Bank and I get more interest out of my savings account. I, could, I have no ATM fees, they're super nice. They give to charity and they say, look, pay us what we deserve. And they do everything the other bank does. Plus, they show me where, like, when I swipe my card, they show me, like, what, like, how green the companies were that I that I like spent in that day, right? So they're training me to understand how to make the world a better place, and they don't put my money in that stuff, right? FDIC insured, the same thing. So why why wouldn't I, right? That's the question. And so people just don't know, and that's partially why I got so motivated to like make the movie. I'm like, man, th I I'm learning stuff. Like, people need to know this. Let's get some questions from the audience here. Who do we, yep. Right here. Hi. Um, so I was looking at the poster and like it goes either left or right. Um, but you're talking about having a gray area. Is there, is there um, 
always like one path you can choose or um, do you feel like sometimes you need both like a balance of dark and like light side of like, you know, not everything is, you know, going like one way or the, the yeah, other? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I think we're at a point right now where we have to decide if we want to live. I mean, the, the, the oceans are choking. There's plastic everywhere. I mean, it's, it's bad. Like, cl like climate science isn't debated outside of America. It's just a skewed political thing that happens here. And so we have to decide what, like this system isn't working. What's happening is as business grows, world problems are growing. And there's a lot of, you know, this, this whole conversation about the fourth sector economy where they're going to incentivize with tax benefits uh, companies that are doing cool things. But I think it's, you know, if a system is, is broken and it's giving you results that aren't great, then you have to, tr you know, shift how the engine runs. And so, look, is business bad? I've come to learn that. I don't, I don't think that is, right? Business is what it is. It's delivering value for society. So really what we have to ask ourselves is where do we put our money? Where do we put our energy? And what value does it derive for society? And then it's, it's kind of a, a more complex kind of economic thing, but like, if you don't factor in these things called externalities, so it's like if I have an oil company and I, you know, I make all these profits and my shareholders are happy, but like all this pollution and all this stuff that comes from my product, society pays for, those things, those externalities, we're paying for. Taxpayers are paying for, dot orgs are paying for. Like it's, it's a thing. And so once you, it's, once you kind of move into this thing called full cost accounting and be like, what's the actual price of gasoline? Oh, yeah, it's the death of all humans. That, that, that's, that's great. We could pay for that, right? And, and so you start looking down and just being honest about what we're doing. It's like, okay, once you look at it clearly, there's no, there's no right answer, but there's a direction that makes sense. So for what, what we're doing is, and, and, you know, like I feature a lot of companies in the film. I'm not applauding these companies per se because tomorrow they could do something really dumb or they could change their mind and a lot of them, you know, do good things and bad things, right? But all we're doing is applauding good behavior and being like, hey, that one thing that you, you showed us right there, that's really cool. That's great. Keep doing that, right? And so as you applaud the good behavior, everything starts to move in, in a better direction. And, um, you know, we're all trying, you know, it's like, you know, we have, we featured a couple of big companies that have done stuff that maybe we wouldn't be proud of, or, you know, someone wouldn't be proud of. And it's, it's almost like that, like, like prison, uh, you know, is there incarceration or is there rehabilitation, right? Like, what do you say? Like, okay, because you did something wrong in the past 50 years ago, guy that wasn't even, that isn't even there now, you guys are a big evil company, or you have so much power, you have a hundred thousand employees and you have billions of dollars and you could start doing better. Great join the party, right? And so, so that's where we've, we've kind of come to understand. It's just like, like micro behavior mod, right? I'm going to ask a kind of cynical question, and I apologize. Uh, but I'm wondering if in doing your research on companies, you ended up finding companies that saw uh, uh, progressive ideas as more of a marketing campaign idea than actually doing stuff within their their company, presenting the idea that, hey, we are making progress here, but at the same time really are actually doing like worse things for the for the 100%, globe. Hundred percent, hundred percent. There's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of BS out there, and um, yes, like corporate social responsibility is what it's usually called for them, right? Yeah, and like you know, some of it's nice. It's like, oh, look at look at this picture of us giving over here, but we're you know destroying this thing over here. So there's a lot of that. But what's happening is they're getting called out on that stuff. And so you know, if you do it and it's doing good, that's cool. That's great. Uh, keep doing more of that. But what, what they're starting to understand is that the value set is, okay, so the biggest transfer of wealth right now in history is happening between baby boomers and millennials. And so it's, it's mostly like their wives, so women and millennials, they have a very different value stack. And they're like, look, I care about the future. I care about what you do. If you do this thing, like I'm not going to be a customer of your business and all that. And so they get it. So I've, there was a lot of greenwashing in the last decade or so. Now these big companies are like, oh man, we got to mean it. And we don't have the DNA for it. So they're like trying to hire these like kids that are like, you know, into the stuff. And like, we, we don't know what to do. And so what, what I'm seeing happen is almost like this kind of viral upload of DNA where they're like, well, we can't do it because we're too big and clunky and like just we don't get it. So this company right here is doing really great. Let's buy them. And at first they'd buy them and then just kind of like wipe out all their like, you know, the, the, what made them cool. And then they, they, they stop being profitable because the customers are like, oh yeah, that's not, that's not that anymore. Buy. So now they're like, hey, why don't we leave them alone? 
And once they start leaving them alone, they're like, you know, that's the most profitable part of our new kind of portfolio. Like, what are these guys doing? Why does that work? And so they're learning how to be cooler. Um, and, that, and that to me is very, I, that makes me very enthusiastic. Next question. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering what the editing process was like for this film. Um, you're ta tackling such a big issue and you have so many different things to show. So I was wondering how you kind of trimmed it down to tell a cohesive story and to sort of choose a path that you wanted to take with it. Great question. Um, I started filming when I had hair. <laughs> it, it, was, it was a bear to edit because uh, the stories just kept getting bigger and um, we had to, and, and like, let's face it, this isn't like the most exciting subject matter when you're talking to like economists and stuff. So I'm like, yo, how do you keep people like watching this? Um, and, I, and I think we did a great job and, you know, to the credit of my team. Um, but, you know, what it boiled down to was um, really what's in it for me as a viewer, right? Like, how do, why does this impact me? Why does this, why does this influence, what, why should I care? And that's kind of the biggest thing you gotta address anyway, right? And so we, we, we got some real heartfelt stories of stuff that's happening and things that like you're already buying and things that you're doing. Um, and it took a long time. I mean, look, during the making, like so Whole Foods sold to Amazon during the making of the film. Like, so and the ground moves from under your feet. So it's been a very dynamic editing. It's been, no, hold on. Film is done. I'm still not like, the, the movie per, per, is in theaters this week. So I'm still like in, you know, we're finishing it mode. It's done. It's coming out in theaters. But we've had to stay really agile through this thing. And I've already decided that this is going to turn into a TV show and keep going. Because this story, this story is just beginning. Right. And those companies kind of need to be on their toes consistently. They need a TV show out there that's either calling them out for doing good or calling them out for, for not doing good, you know? That's it. That's it. And, and the incentives are, are, you know, so like we didn't take money. So like when we first started, there was one company that was like, you know, give us a grant for a hundred grand. And I was like, no creative, like we have a hundred percent creative control. And they're like, okay. But then I realized I, I can't take money from anyone who's in this film to make this film. And so it's like, okay, you guys are over there. This is absolutely journalistic. And you'll see after like a company that we featured, you know, they just kind of randomly were doing something cool. They're like, this is our best promotional piece ever because we were just honestly looking at them and we're not like a shill. And so, um, you know, it became this thing where it's like, I'm going to keep journalistic integrity and we're going to watch what you're doing. And when you're doing something cool, that's great. And when you're not doing something cool, that's on camera too, dude. Right? I think I have time for one more question right Hi. here. Hi. So I love this idea of voting with your dollar, uh, but we live in an age of disinformation and every corporation has their PR team that's ready to spin whatever they're doing. So how do you recommend consumers like me navigate this research process about looking into where they spend their money? Great question. Great question. Great question. And that's, that's a challenge, right? It's like everything's a propaganda war right out there. And so, you know, at the end of the day, the internet doesn't lie and what happens is people start coming up and being like ah no you're not doing that right and so what we did is we've created an app that's like pulled third-party data from all of the different gr uh, groups out there that look at these things uh, and then what am I going to be like the guy that like calls it right because then those guys are buying trying to buy me lunch right and, and, and so then I said okay what do we do then we just open this up to people voting up and down and there's always going to be trolls there's always going to be things that the internet will throw at trying to you know move this but you know look into their story look into what they're about uh, see if they practice what they preach, you know, see what people, employees are saying. Here's the thing too, it's like as this workforce is changing and mo more, more people are like from millennial uh, generation going in there and you're like, wow, I came over here because I believe in what you, what you sold me as a bill of goods and you guys are full of crap, right? Those guys are talking. Right, so from within the company, if, if the company sucks, the employees are like, ah, you know, I really, I really thought this was something else. It, to me, that's a, a very powerful internal voice that, that will you know, be more honest than a company's PR machine. And, so, and they're realizing it. Like, you just can't lie anymore. Like, there's this transparency that's coming through the internet and through all these kind of new media things that we have. So it's, really, it's shaking things up in a very good way, in my opinion. That corporate disinformation uh, concept is, is really what has been the driving force against climate science in this country. I mean, that is the greatest example in this country of man's greatest foe 
being treated as non-existent simply because of corporate disinformation to the point where, you know, I think just this past year we found out that Rex Tillerson has emails from when he was the head of, uh, which oil company was he the head of? Was it Chevron? Exxon. That he has uh, several email chains discussing climate change as if it actually, as if it exists, he knows it exists, and how can they get around it? Which is... It's one, there's currently a class action lawsuit against the major oil companies for providing disinformation against climate change. So it's sort of one of those things that's like, it, how do we get around it? Uh, we wisen up, right? And so it's like, okay, great. You know, Tesla, Volt. I mean, there's a lot of options that you can go that are non-petroleum, right? And so, you know, to me, like I looked at all this and it's like, wow, these guys have billions of dollars invested. They have trillions of dollars coming back over the next 30 years on the books. And they're like, hey, yo, this is our money. Like, don't mess with it. So it's easier to do what they've done than to clean it up. But that's just because people are looking away, right? And when people stop looking away and people are just like, no, you just stop swiping your credit card. Don't give them money. And as that starts to happen more and more, it's just like, you, you know what? You, they just don't have the same energy to buy the media to convince you otherwise, right? And so there's, there's a lot that's happening with that, but you have to know that that is a phenomenon. That's a thing, right? Because people still kind of trust their TV. They, you know, they don't understand that a lot of media is propaganda. And a lot of it comes with a bias. And that has led to the exact world that we have now. Right. And so, you know, if it's this entire country was predicated on an, an enlightened citizenry. Right. This whole democracy was based on people kind of knowing what's up and then voting. The people don't like, just tell me, tell me what to vote. Right. Tell me what to do. And so because of that, now it's just like it's all just about reality TV stars making the most noise. And they're like, I trust that guy. I don't trust that guy. It's all instinct. And, but that said, this idea that uh, going into looking at our media as if it's potentially propaganda, that idea has become bought by the other, I don't want to say the other side, but that idea has become bought by the corporations and saying like, no, 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 now when you go and you listen to a sort of climate scientist that's on CNN, know that that person's pro a propaganda arm for the Democrats, you know? like So people are, li are swimming, even if they want to just be told what to vote. It's like this weird, impossible propaganda war that they're all involved in. And I think each side has kind of gotten smarter in how... Or, the one side has gotten smarter in how they are presenting their pop, their propaganda. Here's one of the problems uh, in media in general is um, you want to get in shape, work out. Stop reading tabloids about like six pack abs. Just get, and then you'll see what works, right? And so one of the other things that these guys do is like, oh, look over here, look over here. I said this, I said that. It's like, you know what? I know how to read. Mm -hmm. Let me go read a study. Let me read into this a little more. And people are so used to now being spoon fed that they're just trying to figure out who they should trust instead of like looking and understanding things for themselves. Trusting themselves. Trusting themselves and, and, and learning how to learn. And then once you do that, you're like, oh, 98% of really smart climate scientists, if not 99 to 100%, are all saying, yo, this is the thing. Mm -hmm. But there's all this propaganda in media saying the opposite, why? Follow the money. Always follow the money. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Always follow the money. Uh, I realize we've talked only about prosperity, uh, and you have a book coming out as well, Patron. We need to talk about that. What is the book that you have coming out right now? Uh, the book is called The Art of Stopping Time, and it's designed around this idea that we're all, like, we're walking off this cliff because we just can't even stop to think. Yeah. Right, And so if we were to learn to stop and check in with ourselves and learn to, like, the, like we're just getting crushed under stress. We're getting crushed under time compression. And so what happens there is when you're in that state of mind, you're coming from the amygdala, right? And it's all just fight or flight and stress. But when you learn to just kind of breathe deeply to your abdomen and slow down for a second, you're coming from here, the prefrontal cortex, which is negation of impulses, higher moral reasoning, the stuff that makes us human. And so because the news media is, they're going to get you, they're going to get you, the world's ending, you know, like it's, you're shell-shocked and you're just like, like panicked saying, somebody protect me, somebody help me. You're describing my weekend. Totally, totally, <laughs> totally, right? The majority of this past weekend was me like, oh my God, it's going down, it's going down. It's going down, right. And so Party's because, over. But because of that, then you make impulsive decisions, right? And so like poker players, like they say, oh, he's on tilt, right? Like it, once you're on tilt, like the guy just starts betting differently and he like loses all his money. And so people are living on tilt. And so like for me, it's like, okay, I, well, I sat with all these masters in, in the Himalayas. I know how to teach that. But I could teach you meditation 
conversation till I'm blue in the face. And that's hard because I'm brown, right? Like I, I could do that, but it still won't work if you make bad decisions all the time and you don't know how to say no to things and all that. And so it became a, a quick, and it's like, okay, so you're gonna teach me how to stop time? Uh, you're gonna make me read 350 pages? No. It's one to one and a half pages a day, just mini chapters that are like, hey, today think about this. And like, we just did a study on it um, with a, an independent panel did a study and like average was like 28, 30% improvement in like sleep, stress, time for yourself and all this, just from people like stopping to like recognize that they're alive and they should just like take a moment. And it's, ch it's changing lives and it's just because like, I, I just needed to kind of shake people and be like, hey, listen, you're fully capable of making all these decisions and like coming home to yourself. What what are you doing? Like why are you why are you even looking over there? And it's because they're 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 just driving off this cliff, right? So the book comes out on the twenty fourth, um, and the movie comes out in theaters this week. Fantastic. Twenty fourth, stopping time, and uh, this week people can see Prosperity, a, a wonderful documentary. You're doing incredible work, super important work. Patron, thank you so much for being here. Give them a round of applause, everybody. Thank you.